Okay, time is a factor here, so this video is made in some considerable haste as the World Health Organization has just raised the phase level on the me, the Spanish Spanish the swine influenza, the swine flu from phase three to phase four, which is a very significant change. Now in this case, knowledge as always enables prevention. So you need to start understand where these things come from to understand what you can do about it. All these things start off in animals, and eventually you get mutations in the viruses and the animal population that allows them to hop species to the human population, to the people population. Now these viruses typically, these virus mutations typically happen at a fairly slow rate, and the mutation that allows it to hop the species usually means that it is actually at that time not transmissible between people and people. Usually that doesn't happen. And it takes some considerable time after the after the virus has been kicking around in the human population for some considerable amount of time. Usually, get another mutation that allows the people to people transfer. So, what the World Health Organization does is, the second you get this phase, this is phase three, transferring from animals to people, as they come in, and they will sort of kill and incinerate all the animals, and hence wipe out that strain of the virus. And this also minimizes the human exposure to it, which minimizes the risk of the virus going from phase three, where it is only transmissible between animals and people, to phase four, where it is transmissible between people and people. Now this latest swine flu has essentially materialized in phase four, which is people to people transmission, which is really fairly bad news. And to put this all into historical perspective, the last big influenza outbreak was in 1920. And it is reckoned that it infected something like 40% of the world's population and killed 50 million. Comparable death toll to the entire of the Second World War. So there is fairly significant potential to these pandemics. And in order to assess how nasty these things are, there are there are various factors. Uh, of those factors, there are, of the fraction who contract it, what percentage die? And in the current case, it's reckoned it's about 6%. These very early numbers, but early indications suggest about 6 to 7%. In the last big Spanish flu and influenza outbreak, it was about 2.5%. So potentially, this is much more serious. So this is much more potentially hazardous in the fraction of people it kills. Other one, other factors are is who does it kill? As in the last Spanish influenza outbreak, one of the things that made it so uh, damaging to civilization was the fact that it killed young adults. And again, with this swine fever, swine flu outbreak, it also looks like it kills young adults. So this is again something that makes this this swine flu appearing in phase four as very potentially harmful. Another problem is that now we have half a million people a day travelling around the world by airplanes, which means there is far greater potential. We are potentially at much higher risk of a worldwide pandemic because of this perpetual homogenization of the world's population through air transport. Now, on our plus side, we also have organizations like the World Health Organization who have planning for potential pandemics and, attempt to con to, and attempting to control them. So, you need to understand what these things always look like on paper. And so this is going to be total deaths, and this one's going to be time. What you find is all of these pandemics look something like this, where there's this big growth phase in the middle where it's essentially out of control. But what you find is that relatively modest changes very early on can make huge differences in the total death toll. So everything is about getting on top of these things as early as possible and stopping them before they start. And the most obvious example of this would be is 
if you get it when there's only one person infected, you can essentially nullify the whole thing before it starts. Now, like I was saying, we have various global organizations that are in place to try to help this, to try to minimize the early uh, spread of the virus, place the, like the World Health Organization. Then you go down to the national level, where in England we have the National Health Service, which is not only uh, a large organization which has daily experience of running large-scale operations, but it also has extensive planning for pandemic control. I know it's stockpiled several million doses of antivirals, admittedly, therefore, the avian flu, the bird flu, but the early indications are that that is also effective against the swine fever here, the swine flu. In America, there is the Center for Disease Control, which is a smaller organization which doesn't have the daily experience of running these large-scale operations, but and I, I'm not sure what their position is with respect to planning for such eventualities or what their stockpiles of antivirals are like. But I was unsettled by the effectiveness of the US government, the, 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 the response of the US government to Katrina. Uh, I, I have limited faith in the ability of the US government to conduct large scale operations like this. So, irrespective of the, the, these big organizations, essentially, these organizations need to be in place prior to you getting a phase 4 virus. Once it, it's too late at this point to actually construct such an organization, they need to be in place beforehand. So now it's down to the individuals. What can you as an individual do to try to minimize the potential hazard from this virus. And they're fairly simple hygiene protocols from the World Health Organization. You need to understand how viruses spread and the viruses die if they, they don't die, they, they, they're destroyed if they try out. So they're almost always transmitted in very small amounts of liquid. So when someone sneezes that goes everywhere and if someone then later touches that, people touch their face far more often than they think. And that's a, a very standard way of, of transmitting the virus. So it's important to keep your hands clean, to try not to touch things if you've been in public and to try not to touch your own face. If you are in areas where there are lots of people, you have a far higher chance of, of being exposed to the virus. So avoid places, especially like airports. Airports are a nightmare for this because you have people coming from all over the world into a relatively confined area. And if you do end up in these very busy places with lots of people, try to keep distance from people and try not to touch things. Okay. And try to avoid places, enclosed areas uh, with poor ventilation, with lots of people, things obviously example bars and nightclubs. And the opposite is of course true, uh, nice airy areas where things dry out quickly are very good. Okay, and lastly try to keep in good health as in a strong metabolism is less likely to be infected by a virus, it is less likely to succumb to a virus if you do get infected, and so sleep well, eat well, and get lots of exercise. Okay, and if you follow those, it, it, it all boils down to cost benefits, cost benefits analysis. If it goes nowhere, Right? If all this is all storm in the teacup in a week's time, everyone's forgotten about this, then you have lost something. You have invested the time needed to follow these hygiene procedures. However, if it turns out to be a significant problem, and by following these hygiene procedures you can reduce it from this to this, seeing as your chances of being anywhere on this line are effectively the same, and you reduce it to this, 
you not only greatly reduce your prospect of getting um, exposed to this virus, you, ex you reduce everyone else's chances of getting exposed to this virus. So with that, I wish you good luck.